30 moderates, few debates have become as fraught and contentious as the debate, not only over trans rights, but over what's been known as gender affirming care, puberty blockers, and the anatomical changes that people under 18 have been making to their bodies uh, in the name of identity. Um, it's not an easy issue. It's an issue which has rocked the political world, um, often gets caught up between good and bad faith and awful faith debates about who people should be, how they should be, and what laws should be passed in response to those. However, there is a middle ground, as Dirty Moderate prides itself on, and it's worth exploring what are some of the real concerns about what kids are doing to themselves, what choices parents have, and what it means uh, to be trans or to be non-binary or to really question yourself and then how to handle it. My guest today is Stella O'Malley. Stella is an Irish psychotherapist who had her own intense experience with gender as a child, and the resolution of that gender distress made her very curious uh, about the wisdom of early intervention. She has presented documentaries on this in 2018. She did one in the UK called Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk. In addition, she facilitates a parent coaching site that offers practical and pragmatic help to parents who are navigating these very rocky shoals. She is the director of something called GenSpect, an international organization that offers a healthy approach to sex and gender. Today, though, we're going to talk a lot about her book, her recent book in 2023, called When Kids Say They're Trans. It's a work which explicitly encourages parents not to immediately consider gender-affirming surgery or other medical procedures that might prove irreversible. Stella co-wrote this with her colleagues, and she argues that only parents really know best. And their book, the book, by the way, is co-written by Sasha Ayad and Lisa Marciano. They all hope that parents make these real life decisions with care and with the knowledge needed to both support their children's identity, but also help them be who they are. I'm really happy to welcome Stella O'Malley and to discuss this current conversation over science that is far from settled, but a debate which rages on. Stella O'Malley, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Great to have discussions about this yes. difficult issue, but very important to discuss difficult, it. Difficult issue. Um, I think I want to start with what I was saying to you before we we went on, on the air, is that the debate over trans issues and gender affirming surgery, and there's so much jargon here, so I'm just using it to, to, mm -hmm. to like um, spitball for a second, is, is become one of these insane conversations, right, that is plagued by not just misinformation and um, censorship and ill will, but the debate seems to fall along. You're either a good faith person and you're pro-trans, or you are a bad faith, evil person, and you are transphobic. And as in life, those binaries are not true. They're not helpful. They, as I always say on this program, most things tend to generate, you know, more heat than light. And so I want to have you want to talk in the most general sense, and of course about your book, which I love when kids say they're trans, uh, about, you know, this really um, serious inflection point. And the best thing before you dive in, I want to remind listeners here, is we have good faith debates here at Dirty Myra. We welcome everybody to the program because we believe, let's let's hear the ideas. Let's discuss yeah. them. Let's not shut them down, especially with something like this, which is far from settled. So Stella, welcome to the show. I just thought we'd like jump off that point and then take it from there. Yeah, it's it's an extraordinary swerve in, in global politics that of all things, trans issues has become a really hot button topic. It, it never has been before. And the way it has been kind of almost owned by the left and rejected by the right is also a swerve that I don't think any of us would have expected. Like if somebody had said 10 years ago, this is going to be the divide between left and right and it's going to be a hot divide. People would have said, really? Left and right? Trans and where, where, where is that? So it's, it's an extraordinary, it's come in like a rocket. It's come in like a rocket in terms of numbers. And before, let's say, about 2012, 2014, there really, like, 
as far as the numbers of people who were medicalizing and transitioning were tiny. So it was kind of a, a, a very small group of people with a small group of clinicians, tiny levels of research, and frankly, not very much interest in from the world. Mm -hmm. Then what happened was an extraordinary explosion happened, and it happened with a, 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 a never before seen cohort. So before that, there'd been two main cohorts, which was mm -hmm. middle aged men and very young children. And I, as you described in the in the intro, I had my own experience as a very young child. I was classic, if you follow me, classic childhood onset gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. And the other the other cohort is the middle aged men. And then some are out of kind of nowhere, one could argue. Some people would disagree with me. But um, teenagers started to presenting to clinics and they'd never been seen before. This was never a cohort that, that had been seen before. So year, remind me, really, sorry, Nora, what year did this start again? I missed that. It shot up at about 2014, about 10 years ago. Yeah, about 10 years ago, you know, it, it was slightly, it was definitely rising from about 2011, 2012, but it, it really started to gain ground. By 2014, it yeah. started to really start to rocket. And then by 2018, it was just all among adolescents, never before seen. So we didn't have any research on adolescents because no research, no, no adolescent, there'd never been adolescent onset. There's obviously, the, you know, there's always a few exceptions that make the rule but they were not a cohort. So there was no generalized research you could have on adolescents. And the right. big difference is suddenly parents wanted to know about trans. You know what I mean? Because obviously these are parents of, of adolescents and uh, the level of comorbidities among these adolescents happens to be very high. So a lot of these adolescents would have other challenges, for example, most commonly autism, but not only autism, ADHD, eating disorders, OCD, um, anxiety, depression. And I know, like, because I love the idea of good faith arguments and I really like to kind of test anything I say. And I know people on on kind of a, a different kind of understanding of gender that I would have, they would say, ah, oh, these people never, never were able to present before. They never felt confident enough to present before. And society had basically finally been open to trans issues and that's why they presented but it still seems to me to be unusual that we saw in even in fiction we saw childhood onset gender dysphoria we didn't see adolescent onset so it's, it's a kind of an unusual phenomenon that happened very very fast yeah i mean one of the things that i want to extract from your book with a kind of central question and it really is a handbook too i mean there's it's a yeah. it's a really well-researched well-argued book because it really helps i'm not a parent but for parents who um, who support their kids too. I, I, again, for those listening, this is not some kind of screed. This is not a, a piece of tendentious bullshit like people write and 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 without um, really considering nuance in the issue. And the issue demands nuance, and it's not getting it. But one of the one of the um, sort of or the cornerstone, I think, to the book, you know, see, seeks to answer or puts at the center a life strategy, right? What purposes do trans identification and transitions serve, right? Very good. And the answers that you guys give, you and your colleagues, Marciano and Ayad, to kind of bring the conflict over gender to a different kind of space, right? Where it hopefully can certainly be discussed, if not resolved, by supporting a young person's move toward a healthy identity, not by transitioning or changing, but by individuating. In other words, not making the crossroads of that teen's experience gender transitioning, but letting them be who they are and deciding that before they make any real substantial changes in their life. Wouldn't you agree with that? I think that's the, yeah. not wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you think that that kind of hyper-focuses your argument? Yeah, that encapsulates what we are, are um promoting in our book. The book that we wrote, we wrote it as a result of all of us work in the field. You know, I I, I run Gen Spect and Sasha Ayad sees a lot of the adolescents and Lisa Marciano sees a lot of detransitioners and parents. So we all work in the field and we got to know each other because we became so overwhelmed by emails from people seeking us. And there was no physical way we could see them all. There's not a chance, not even a, you know, Sasha Ayad's 
waiting list, my waiting list. It's it's ridiculous. So when when your waiting list becomes ridiculous and when you close your waiting list, and I closed my waiting list a long time ago, and you open it right. and then you immediately close it again, you realize something needs to happen because we're not helping enough people. So what we decided right. we, was we should write the book. And the book is explicitly pro-parent because we want to in a way, if and I've, I've written quite a few parenting books and mental health books, and I believe that really in the last 30 years, a lot of, frankly, I, I'm a little bit guilty of it myself because I've written parenting books, but there's mm -hmm. been a kind of a, a gradual disempowerment of parents and parents mm -hmm. turn to professionals very fast, especially if their teenager is distressed. A kind of professionalization of parents, mm -hmm. of parenting. And what we wanted to do was, kind of appreciate and acknowledge the fact that parents are generally the world expert on their kids. Parents generally, not always, there's always exceptions, love their their kids more than anybody else and care about their kids and will think the long game for their kids in a way that a therapist in an office isn't necessarily thinking of. And so we wanted to kind of center the parents back into um, their own families as the authority and to give them the kind of information so that they could, for example, um, make decisions according to, to their own values and not necessarily believe that a fast track or a medicalized approach to a, a gender identity, which has never really been tried before. So it's got no long term evidence, not among adolescents. It hasn't been tried before. Like we're 10 years into it or so that therefore maybe a slower more cautious approach might be more appropriate certainly just to finish i would mm. say that we're most conservative and ca cautious about the things we're most precious about the things mm. we love most in the world is where we go most carefully and slowly and that's our children and so we wrote a book that was very much centering the parent and saying you know what you can do it your way and not necessarily our way your way yeah, I want to go back to the beginning, though, because I mentioned your story in the introduction. Um, I'm not as familiar with your story. So if you allow me to be brazenly American and make you do that expose that those in the UK and Ireland don't like and get sheepish about, I, you know, you have had your own battles with this, as I as I read. I didn't read the book. I just did my research. Can you talk about how that experience obviously not only shaped the, your particular view on this, but shape you and your work in psychotherapy? Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear it. I think we'd love to. All yeah. You know, little did I know all these years later, I'd be talking about this, you know. So when I was a very, you know, when I was a very young child, as far back as my memory goes, so around about three years old, yeah. I came to the conclusion I should be a boy, that I would be better as a boy, that it wasn't right that I was a girl. It didn't make sense that I was a girl. I was mm -hmm. only three. So I, I, you know, I was making sense of the world. I now know that there is a small cohort of children who are like me. And generally when they are like me and I was like this, the whole town knows about it. These kids are not self-conscious about it. They just bleat, I'm a boy and you're going to call me. You know what I mean? As if I'm a boy. In those days, they were. it was called a tomboy, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 That, yeah. I don't even know. You probably can't even say that anymore. But it used to yeah, be. people don't use that word. I'd like to bring it back. Uh, yeah, tomboy, because tomboy suited me because I had the word Tom and boy in it. And there's no equivalent. It's very interesting that there's no equivalent for girl for for boys, if you follow me. There's no kind of Amy girl or Laura yeah. girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now that I've studied it, I would say, yeah, that's true. Because actually, if you look at the research, roughly about 80% of the kids like me who are uh, effectively gender nonconforming, who seek to be the opposite sex, you know, at a very young age, end up being gay, lesbian or bisexual. Yes. And it's higher among the boys. And mm -hmm. so in a homophobic society, which would have been really all the previous generations until almost this one, yep. well, certainly the last couple, um, they would have been uneasy with these girly boys. You know what I mean? So they, we, you know, tomboys are looked upon very affectionately because there isn't the presumption that they're going to be lesbians. It's like, ah, oh, they're just a tomboy. They'll grow out of it. They play ball with us and they're going to yeah. hang with us and they're not. 
but we also as boys don't like them physically in a way yeah. right it's weird kind of gender yeah. nonconforming. yeah the, the adults smile and think oh isn't she feisty and you know one yeah. day she'll grow up and be a swan and if there's a narrative there's a lot in the literature there's a lot of you know there's joe march from little women there's you know what i mean there's there's Pippi Long's talking. Yeah. There's lots in the literature that shows yeah. there was an affection for these feisty little girls who are often very assertive. There wasn't mm -hmm. such affection for the feminine boys. It's never really had a place in society. We certainly don't have affectionate names for these boys. They've always been there running around saying, I'm a little girl. Let me wear my dress. And <laughs> they were, it's very interesting, they were the children that were brought to clinics, much more likely to be a boy that was brought to a clinic than a girl. I wanted to interject here, even though I'm pushing ahead a little bit into your book. Yeah. One of the things I thought that that uh, you, that you guys wrote about, um, which is very important because I'm sure you've gotten criticism unfairly for some of the things you've written, which is that allow you you've you've told parents, uh, and I'm just looking for the piece of it here, but you basically have told parents that. Let the kid boy play with dolls. Let the girl yeah. be a tomboy, essentially. You're yeah. not telling them to stifle the identity. It's Daughter. interesting. It made me think of the craziness we have. I live in California, uh, which is truly insane uh, in its politics, <laughs> in terms of its, its, its leftism. And it, it, thankfully, because it was so politically unpopular, um, our governor, Gavin Newsom, vetoed uh, a bill um, about... Uh, uh, gender neutral toy stores about he he's letting it go through but he didn't sign the bill it's complicated but the idea that um we're not going to have boys if a big box retailer we target or one of those comes here we're not going to separate we're not going to call a boy and girl we're just going to g make it gender neutral i mean as opposed to right a parent okay. like you advise like yeah. i would do to my kids just let the you don't need to you don't need to get rid of gender. Let the boy go play with a Barbie. That's all you have to do. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, you know, maybe Gavin Newsom needs to learn a little bit about child development because it's well established <laughs> that between yes between yeah. about three and seven, the children are learning about roles and sex roles. So these small number like I was, and I'll go back to my story in a minute. Yeah, that they've kind of figured out. Oh, and they've become like nineteen fifties kind of stereotypes. Boys right. do this, girls do that. Do you know what I mean? Right. For a little while. And there's a small number who go, no, I want to be over with the boys or, the, you know what I mean, the opposite. But they become very like uh, old fashioned, almost stereotypical about, you know, the girl will be there doing the kind of the mommy roles and what she perceives as the mommy roles and stuff. It's just a developmental kind of stage that they go through. I went through it and I look back now, I've only got hindsight. So I might be adding arms and legs to this that aren't necessarily true. But all these years later, looking back, I often think I was an internal misogynist. I really didn't think much wow. of girls. I thought this girlish was an insult. I thought prissy, irritating, squealy girls. I didn't like women either. <laughs> Men and boys, <laughs> where was that? So it's right. kind of interesting. Yeah. When I look it back, and I, I remember I just I fundamentally disliked anything to do with girlishness intensely but i that lasted for many many years with me it was in the kind of 70s and 80s in dublin so nobody was bringing me to a, a psychiatrist to get a diagnosis i was considered an eccentric kid just because i was very intense about it i was very over the top i now realize i'm very intense about everything so some kids rather than i had extreme gender dysphoria i'm like i'm very intense and some of these kids are very intense is that necessarily their gender dysphoria or is it their personality? It's kind of a an interesting point. You know, a more gentle person mightn't have pushed it so much, but I certainly did. By the time puberty rolled around many years later, I had kind of got myself into a corner because everybody knew me as this tomboy. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I went, people say, are you a boy or a girl? And I'd kind of answer things like no or boy or <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing. I was all over the place. And Puberty actually ended up being very difficult for me. It was harrowing. I was very lonely. I didn't know what to do. I realized that nature was bigger than me. I came to a, an extraordinary reckoning with my body and myself, realizing I can have, I kind of thought in a very childish, magical thinking kind of way, that if I convince everybody I'm a boy, I'll be a boy. 
Now that's right. classic six-year-old, seven-year-old yes. conceptualization. Yes. Yes. Um, then you get to eight and nine and ten, and you realize they're kind of pandering to me, and this is actually mortifying. You follow me? And then there's puberty. That's an interesting point, though, because I was born in 1974. So uh, me too. Oh yes, so I'm 50 this year. Happy birthday if you already are. Mm-hmm. I I you didn't have the option, right? You weren't stifled. Yeah. You're, this is your experience. Yeah. You didn't have the option to go to a clinic and completely become a boy anatomically. Yeah. or at least attempt to and that's you know that's you know goes to the heart of your book but go on that, yeah. that's psychologically and conceptually massive nobody said you could be a boy i was basically left to it you know what i mean which was very difficult i'm not saying it wasn't it was very difficult but i was never given an option of you could stop puberty because puberty was causing me all the trouble puberty was really 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 difficult for me horrible time However, with puberty, between the ages of roughly 10 and 20, comes a sexual awakening. With the sexual awakening comes an interest beyond yourself to other people, if you follow me. You start to have crushes. You start to fall in love. You start to up your social skills. And I kind of came to a kind of a social awareness of, well, I'd I'd want to kind of sort out the way I look and the way I present if anybody's going to ever fancy me if you follow me. So that was a kind of shocking, horrific dawning for me when I realized uh, I'm I'm in a corner and I need to get out of it because nobody's going to fancy me the way I am. And now mm. I'm, I'm kind of uh, not stereotypical because I didn't end up becoming lesbian, but a lot of girls who would have been like me would become lesbian. And that would add to their feeling of maybe I'm just a boy. Because they're thinking, I fancy women, you, you know what I mean? Things like that. But that didn't happen to me. Anyway, life rolled on. I became comfortable in my own skin. I became comfortable that I was a woman. I ended up getting married and I had children. And having children is the most important part of my life. And then years later, when I was in my 30s, I studied to become a psychotherapist. Went on, wrote about mental health, wrote some books about parenting and mental health and teenagers because I was set. I have a special soft spot for teenagers. I think I had such a hard time myself. Mm. And then many, you know, right up until I think it was 40, I don't know when I was, 45 or something, when I first started commenting about, oh no, it was about eight years ago or something, I started commenting about gender saying, well, actually I had those experiences as a kid and trans was coming in as an issue. And all I was doing was kind of adding my voice saying, well, I, I, I did have those issues and I resolved them. And between the time of me being a young child, then becoming into puberty where it was so difficult, ultimately resolving my issues and rolling on to become an integrated woman. I think whenever I did meet trans people, and I did obviously meet trans people along the way, I would always look at them kind of with a a genuine, uh, they they would resonate with me, but I think that they got stuck and I didn't, if you follow me, that they got stuck in that identity and I didn't for whatever reason. That reason, I, I don't know. Why do mm. why does one person get stuck in something and one person doesn't? Now, people who believe in gender identity would believe that there's a, a soul effectively in you. There's some sort of gender identity within you. And if there's a mismatch, you should medicalize. And those people who transition have a different gender identity than their body. People like me have a different understanding of it. And we would say that we've had a developmental model of understanding, i.e., when you go through any sort of difficult challenge in life, you can you can kind of find a coping mechanism that might make you feel better. For example, mm-hmm. some people might stop eating because it makes them feel powerful. Some other people might start tapping or washing their hands as a way to gain control of their life. There's lots of coping mechanisms there are. And one of them be, could be to be a different sex, to identify out of your own sex or even identify as non-binary. In a way, it's almost the most alluring concept ever that you could be a different person with a different name, with a different personality and a different body. We've never before had that option. Mm-hmm. It's extraordinary. And this these days, children and teenagers are told, you could be somebody different. Would you like to create this other person, this persona? And the extraordinary kind of meeting of the digital world with this idea that you could be a different person. Why? Real rise of the iPhone in its yeah. in its potency was really a decade ago, and that and is it, coinciding. Totally, with, yeah, yeah. 
Yep, totally. So the, the, the extraordinary rise in the iPhone is almost matched with the extraordinary rise in trans. So that's yeah. kind of very interesting. High fi you know, high speed Wi-Fi, social media, all of those uh, graphs are incredibly similar to each other. And I like um, in the book where you reference uh, the social dilemma, that Netflix documentary, and basically say you and your co-authors say, you know, you might want to check your algorithm rather than check into a puberty blocker clinic. Or something. You didn't say it quite like that, but that's how I read it. No, because you yeah. want to look and your parents should look and say, what are their kids seeing? Yeah. Oh my God, I'm really miserable. I just saw four people on TikTok and they're miserable. They yeah. went to a clinic, so I should too, which is, uh, by the way, take the whole debate about identity and individuation, gender out of it. That is a preposterous way to parent. Okay, honey, let me take you. I mean, you're not going for vanilla ice cream. You're going for a life-changing yeah. moment. Yeah. Well, in fairness, I think what's happened on TikTok around diagnosis and mental illness is actually quite frightening. It's not just gender. It's it's not at all just gender. There's an awful lot of online diag self-diagnosis. There's an awful lot of kind of glamorization of mental illness, glamorization yeah. of self-harming behavior. If you were a parent and if you went and pretended to be a 12-year-old child and start your TikTok account, and I advise parents to do it, you will be astonished how soon self-harming, medical kind of pseudo-medical illness, pseudo kind of psychiatric kind of disorders will be just appearing on your timeline. And you'll be thinking, that's that's not even called for. I'm not even looking for it. And it's arriving because it's so common. Among them, trans issues has become huge. So it, it is definitely an issue. It's It's very much a sense of belonging. There's yeah. a there's a sense of belonging in the community, the LGBTQ community. And it's yeah. also a sense of belonging specifically for people who don't feel like other people. Now, you could say that's everybody, yeah. but there's some of us who just don't feel like we belong. And the LGBTQ community is particularly welcoming to them, which is lovely. Yeah. But I don't think you should need to medicalize. I think I, I and I we, we discuss it in the book and you know, our, our, my organization, Genspec, very much kind of runs with this, that puberty blockers is a very extraordinarily authoritarian, high-handed intervention because it stops the sexual awakening of the young person. We've never done this before. Mm -hmm. And so the child is immediately out of sync with all their peers. All the peers are having, first of all, crushes. First of all, crushes on un unattainable people, then crushes on real life people then starting to maybe go out with people and you know maybe the first kiss and all that people who are blocked with their puberty young people they're not getting any sexual awakening there's no yearning to be with so, anybody else i want to like give i want to outline too this is important to to your point you know the sort of two camps because this debate has become so binary it's what your book is trying to way yeah. through the thicket okay there's the first category the affirmation camp which you guys talk about you know there's no shortage of tiktoks and books and materials and summer camps highly profitable clinics as you guys write television shows to push children toward that but then on the other hand there is this sort of um uh as you lay out consideration often vilified Right, because the parent for parents who express alarm or people who are like, oh, wait a second, I'm not sure, of 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 a view that that says, wait a second, let's slow down, and the media and a lot of its um, champions, certainly on the left, I think even on the center left, sadly, you know, are 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 shout at you and say if you deprive, you know, trans presenting children of a medical option, they become suicidal. Um, and that, uh, uh, you know, uh, doctors are pressuring, par pressuring parents to do it and parents feel they have nowhere to turn because they want to support their kids, understandably. And I think they should, as your book is clear about, but they feel pressured into making a very hasty medical decision, uh, not grounded in enough research yet. Well, why are we there? In other words, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, in other words, and I know this is like the sort of existential issue, but why is it, why is it that if a kid is told that they can't transition, we go right to being told they're suicidal? A, is that true? I mean, it just seems, why? I mean, that okay. seems so, I, I know there's a lot to unpack. I, I would, I, I, again, my audience says I'm a gay man. I'm deeply sympathetic to marginalized communities. 
I get it, but but we've lost the damn plot. I mean, how do we get there? I just don't understand. That's why I want. Okay, to we. You know, I've studied this so extensively. I'm actually doing a PhD in it. I'm really, really involved yeah. in this world. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I haven't figured out why, why this has exploded, but I have a couple of thoughts to make okay. about it. Um, number one, it is people made an awful lot of, and especially psychiatry and psychology, made an awful lot of mistakes with gay people in the yes. past. Yes. And they were rejected. They were told they were disordered. They were told yes. that they were sick. Right. And um, we as a community, we as a society, we're, we're embarrassed about what happened. So it's almost like we've got an opportunity to atone for the bad behavior of previous generations with a kind of superlative celebration of a trans identity that they believe is very similar to being gay. Now, I don't see it as being similar to being gay because if you're gay, lesbian or bisexual, you don't stop sexual awakening. You don't no. medicalize anything. You don't um, impair the person's sexual functioning or their fertility. They are free to do as they wish and to fall in love with whoever they wish. You just do yes. nothing. If somebody came to me and they said they think they're gay, I would just, you know, be very nice. But I have nothing to do. I don't have to jump in and get the ambulance or get doctors or do you know what I mean? All, all I have to do, right? Yes, that's you're, right. You're, right. You're an antidote to antiquarian thinking that said it was a disorder. It's an yeah. accepting yeah. thing. You love people, yeah. love yourself, love people of the same yeah. gender and then counsel them through their emotional journey, but nothing to yes. do with the politics of it. You know? So uh, equally, if somebody came to me and said, and they were young and they said they were, they were trans, I could say, yeah, I, there's nothing I need to do. I would counsel them on their emotional journey, but I don't need to do anything. If you follow me, let them find themselves would be where I would come from. Let them. However, medicalizing it is jumping many steps ahead very fast, mm -hmm. I would argue. So to the reason why people seek to medicalize it is purportedly because they believe there's a suicide risk. But the suicide risk has been studied. Do you remember I said 10 years ago there was no research. We just didn't know. Yeah. And people talked about suicide risk, but there was no research. Thankfully, now we actually have very strong research because it's been followed. So what they did was they followed the biggest uh, gender identity clinic for children in the world, which was JIDS at the Tavistock in the UK. They followed yeah. it over a course of 10 years, 2010 to 2020. And over that those 10 years, there was 15,000 children both being seen and on the waiting list. So in its entirety, 15,000 children. And of those 15,000, four children uh, were known or suspected to have died by suicide. So four out of 15,000 isn't much higher than any mental health, any children with mental health issues, if you follow me. I so anxiety. I buttress your point for a second. I follow closely the report from Tavistock, which I know they shut down, right? The BBC did a really extensive analysis. They're no, they're no right wing group. And I, what's the reporter's name? Hannah, you probably Barnes. Know she Hannah Barnes. Yes, and Hannah the Barnes, thing that yeah. she uh, spoke about, uh, really, which was really the core of it, is that the sense of shame that many young people feel, especially boys, but not all, about mm -hmm. being bisexual, right, got transmuted uh, into this idea that they might be gender, uh, need a gender affirming surgery, they might be trans, they might be non-binary, a lot of it had to do with the gay shame you're talking about, the sort of internalized homophobia, therefore, right, the logic went, oh, I, I'm ashamed of myself, and I'm a boy, if I become a girl, right, then I can be with a boy, and I'm heterosexual. I'm straight. I thought Hannah's. I thought it was very interesting because I don't know. I'm sure Hannah got pilloried and BBC got pilloried, but it seemed like an incredibly uh, thorough analysis, and it seems to dovetail with your research. Yeah, there's a very strong proportion, disproportionate number of young adolescents who are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. They first come out as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, and then they come out as trans. As in, right. I tried being it, and I felt uncomfortable because I have to say that coming out as gay you are declaring your sexual you know tendency your preference none of us who are heterosexual we don't have to come out <laughs> it's yeah. a big thing you know what I mean to suddenly say if I had to say at 13 what I like sexually or 15 oh my god can I not <laughs> Do right. you know? no, I mean, well and I think discussions of sexuality and gender get terribly um 
muddled and 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 full of full of um not just misinformation but myth so i, I give an example yeah. I've been out since I'm 20. And one of the things you learn when you come out young, and I came out in the 90s, so I've been doing it a long time now, is how many guys uh, I've met who are bisexual or who are gay and don't have an acceptance. Some are absolutely bi, they like both. Some are mm -hmm. experimenting and others are uh, are gonna be gay. They're on the road, you know? <laughs> it used to be an old joke, oh, bi now, gay later. I don't know if you ever heard that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, uh, and I would, you know, date many of them and whatever. They might have been full of confusion or whatever. But the difference is, is that fluidity and sexuality is as old as time. Okay, the Greeks, the Romans, this isn't new. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, and, and social justice warriors, to everything to them, because there's a terrible narcissism. Every idea is new. We're championing the idea. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, young kids on Instagram DM me and tell me I'm not woke enough. And I've told them who I am and what I did. And oh, I didn't know you came out. Oh, I didn't know you came out. And <laughs> you don't know anything. You watch social media and you talk the same way you don't know history about anything. You make yeah. things up based on emotion or social contagion, right? So my point in saying this is all is that gender and sexuality are two different things. And this is, does not mean that there aren't real people who are trans and they deserve our respect and dignity. They do. It's a big choice, uh, a big, excuse me, a big part of their identity that after 18, they can decide if they want to have uh, any kind of physical alterations or changes or surgeries. But I have never woken up a day in my life and felt like I'm not a man. I'm still a man. I'm just a man who's attracted to men. So I don't have that journey. It's a very different journey. But I also don't have the belief that many activists do as a gay man that everybody's secretly gay. You know, the gay rights movement's goal was not to make everybody gay, it was for dignity under the law. You know, I think there's a segment of trans activists that those are the people that upset me the most, who insist that gender doesn't exist and that the notion of it is preposterous and biology is not real. And it's like, okay, guys, you're just, you're just an anti-science group of cranks. That's yeah. all. You might be struggling. You might have your own stuff, but don't tell me because if gender is not real and now that's not real, then I'm not a man who likes men. I mean, that now you're taking away my identity. I am in support of everybody's identity, but you do you and stop the proselytizing. That's my issue with that segment of the community. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Like you do you and let me do me and let us all each do each other. But to That's go back to the liberation, all of a sudden now we have police yeah. in the name of, you know, uh, they're cops in the name of liberty. It's like, give me a break. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but to, to go back to the gay point, imagine yeah. if when a child came out as gay or lesbian, that they immediately medicalized it and concretized it. It would be like, whoa, 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 slow down. You know what I mean? They're 12, if you follow me. But there's a lot of growing to do. Yes, I had girlfriends, a very serious girlfriend in high school. And when I dated girls, and that's right, there were I didn't, there were parts of me I didn't know. There were parts I remember as a younger kid feeling. And then there were times as a teenager I felt very inclined to women. I didn't know. So I'm, no, I'm glad there was no medical procedure. I absolutely ended up being gay, but I'm glad I got to explore. And by the way, for the guys in my life who I've known who explore men and women on a regular, great. That's just, that's just fluidity. That's human. It's yeah. not, and yeah. it doesn't require law or fiat or social contagion to figure yeah. out. It's just who they are. Yeah. So uh, we'd be very pro, like, do whatever you want, wear whatever you want, wear makeup, you know, run sure. around with jewelry, wear a dress, do you whatever you want. Play, play with the doll if they want, of course. Mm -hmm. But you just don't, to medicalize your identity, to stop your sexual awakening, to go into a limbo for some years, and then to start again with a, a synthetic chemical puberty of the opposite sex is a pretty radical intervention that should have a heavy body of science behind it. And it doesn't and exist. There is no long-term body of science. And this, this is a largely American audience we're speaking to, which other reason I'm bringing you on, is the other thing we have to know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit of this NHS puberty blocker news. Um, uh, the America is something of an outlier in this, mm -hmm. is it not? There's sort of like the scientific community and the sort of liberal bent of it now, as I have been following it, and you can correct me and give me fill in details, seems to say that we can't even really have a discussion over this. This is a Republican attack on trans people, so therefore we can't discuss it. Meanwhile, I know that Finland and Germany, and you're probably more familiar with the European countries, have, have brought these procedures into great question, if not outright banned puberty blockers or gender transitions under 18 for reasons. So for scientific reasons that don't exist, you know, for, for, 
for reasons that are not scientifically grounded. So the NHS, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, has recently um, banned this stuff. And I, I just wonder what's the, um, uh, what, what's going on in England? I'm just looking. OK, um, well, um, what's happened is, well, when you look at Europe first and then I'll go to England, you yeah. know, Sweden and Scandinavia were pretty much the, the pioneers of pediatric gender transition. They Which were the ones. ones Sweden, and who? Sweden, Sweden and Scandinavia in general. They were the pioneers. They led the, the, the show and they have pulled back. So Sweden has pulled back. Finland's pulled back. Norway's pulled back. Denmark's pulled back. France has pulled back. The UK has now recently pulled back. All of them were pro-puberty blockers. They have now done systematic reviews or they've done their studies of the cohorts that were um, blocking their puberty and then going on to the opposite sex puberty. And they've realized that actually the results are very inconclusive. There's no sufficient evidence to say no. this is a, a healthy positive intervention instead yeah. we've got an awful lot of distress and an awful lot of continued um challenges so the, it, it hasn't been the kind of the magic and kind a of panacea for a better life and on top of that may i point out uh, there's been extraordinary rises in medical tra transition or puberty blockers among uh young people so if you look at it in in, in england it was four thousand and five thousand percent among girls rise in the number of adolescents because it was tiny numbers and then suddenly it was much higher. But there was no right. corresponding drop in suicide rates. So if you look at this over the last 10 years, it's like, well, if this was going to be, well, they will die by suicide, surely we would have prevented an awful lot of suicides with this skyrocketing numbers of people who are medically transitioning. But there was no impact. It, it didn't impact them at all. So that's just a, a kind of an added point around you know, that this is nothing, this does not impact the suicide figures. It never was a high suicide risk. These are very distressed kids who do need a lot of care. I, I don't deny that. And I hope they all receive all the care that they need. I think we're living in a society where we're very prone to look for, you know, a pill for every ill. I think, honestly, the numbers of, of teenagers on SSRIs is frightening. The number of children on all sorts of medications and gender is just one of the many medications they're starting to be medicalizing personalities, medicalizing their gender identities. We've never done it before. And how is it going? I would say not very well, because if SSRIs and Ritalin and Adderall were going to help the younger generations, we'd know it by now because we've been doing it since the 1990s. We would know. <laughs> You know what I mean? We we would have the good results in. We're not getting good results. In fact, if you look at Jonathan Haidt's new book, The An Anxious Generation. Yeah, and that speaks about the iPhone room kids. Isn't that kind of the whole... Yeah. yeah. Not only is it the phone-based childhood, but it's also the frightening rates of depression and anxiety among this, this very over-prescribed and over-diagnosed generation. They are not thriving as a result of it. But I've right. kind of lost the thread of what I was saying. But yeah, technically, just to go back to so the NHS, which is England, yes. they, and yes. Britain. Well, it's NHS I lived in England. London for two years, and I loved everything about it. And I use the NHS regularly, obviously not for this. But I thought yeah. they were great, so I hope they... So they have announced uh, they are block, they're banning puberty blockers, except in the case of clinical trials. The big flaw in this whole puberty blockers experiment was yes. they never had control groups. So we do not know what would have happened had some of these kids been allowed to have puberty and some of them had. Had they only done that, we would know. We'd have a comparison. We'd have we'd have an idea. So but we don't. Sweden and Finland, all these places that are pulling back, which is, you know, America now being an outlier and sort of not not the cold country, but in the way that medicine's treating it. Did Were the politics so radical there that they allowed all this to be pushed in a way without any scientific discussion in these countries? That, is that what happened? Is that why they went as far as they did and pulled back? In other words, it's such a small, I guess the other thing I ask is such a small percentage of the community. And I, and I want to make this clear, and your book does too, I'm advocating for the dignity of everybody. But, but we're yeah. also talking about science and real life changes. So how, is, how did, how did a, an issue this small subsume medical evidence in, commu in a community in Europe like it did? And I know, I know why. I know the sort of wokeness of it all here. But I know they're, to my question is, they're pulling back now. Why did it accelerate there? 
Something. Well, it accelerated because there was a theory. Again, I would go back to there was an equivalence between trans and gay and people thought, oh, we've got gay part two and we'll do it right this time. This is my theory. I don't have evidence on that. But That's I believe, interesting. yeah, it is an interesting theory. But the second reason was in the Netherlands, which is where they brought in the experiment, they basically had um, a group of scientists who decided to try puberty blockers as an intervention for these gender non-conforming young people. They'd never okay. tried it before. Puberty blockers were created for a very specific um, condition, which is called precocious puberty. And some very young children, we're talking three, four, five, six year old children, they go into a precocious puberty and they have to be blocked from it because it's not appropriate for a girl who's five to be getting grown breasts and having a period. So instead you block it. And then when they're nine or 10, you stop taking the blockers and they go into their biological puberty. So that's what it was created for. And it was created in the 1980s. And a, a clinician in a Netherlands clinic was kind of very much ex exercised by the fact that the males who go through male puberty were having ver very serious difficulty if they transitioned in adult life uh, to present as a woman because of their voice because of their facial hair, because they're Adam's apple and their masculinized body, they weren't able to pass. And so the clinicians thought, imagine if we blocked their puberty, they would pass much better. Now, the reason why the clinicians were examining this point was because the, 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 the life of people who medically transitioned as adults wasn't, you know, statistically very happy they have 19 times more likely to die by suicide much more likely to be in a psychiatric hospital much more likely to be you know in hospital and and in prison so it was a difficult life so they thought well maybe it's because they're just they're not passing as women and so we need to block their puberty early and so that they will be able to pass as women Okay, so that was the theory. But by the way, therefore, there was never any reason for girls because testosterone utterly masculinizes. So that wasn't an issue for girls. If I took my uh, testosterone for a few years, I would look male and I, they're very, very fast. And the male voice would come on me. But for men, it's not so easy to pass as women. And that's why they brought it in. It was a theory. And I think theories are worth examining, but they should have had a control group. They had 70 children. And they decided to block their puberty and follow them. And of those 70 children, 15 got knocked out of the study for reasons because of health complications such as diabetes and obesity and heart complications. That's worrisome already. And then of the 55 that were left out of the, the 70 original, one of them died as a result of a medical transition, the genital surgery. Um, one person died and the rest of them all went on to medicalize as adults. And that became the groundbreaking clinical study called the Dutch Protocol. And from that, it spread like wildfire. So it was kind of in and around 2011, the first results came, and then 2014, the second results came. And it just spread as a concept. And, you know, psychiatry and health in general, we love solutions. We love innovation. We love exciting new ideas. You know, when Prozac first came and the sure. idea that, yeah. It's so exciting to think yeah. we have something, we have something new, and it's going to help a huge amount of people. And it's exciting and it's compelling and it's, you know what I mean? And I feel that we got wrapped up in the idea that we had a solution, a very yeah. radical solution. There's something very compelling about that. But right. um, it's, it's, it's a very small number of children. One of them died. Many of them pulled out. Some of the results are only for about 32 of these 70 kids originally. It's not a great study by anybody's measure. When you look at the COVID studies and stuff like that, they were much higher quality oh, yeah. than this little oh, yeah. I mean, study. The, about a year ago, I, I don't remember, and, and well, there's been a few of them, but there was a big uh, article in the New York Times about people uh, who had detransitioned. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, you may have read it. You know, we, can, uh, we can analyze it in the main, okay? What is going on with people detraining? You know, this is the subject no one wants to talk about. So we talk about yeah. it here, but we don't bullshit. So yeah. good for you. <laughs> percent, well, we just want to get to the here's the thing. It's and it might be an editorial, but I want to, I'm not gonna lie to people. Um yeah. what about pe the number of people detransitioning? I feel like that news gets either buried or underreported. I mean, I was shocked the New York Times even did it, but of course it capability for it. 
How many of these people who, who do this before they're 18 end up detransitioning? Do we know? Well, you know it's different, I know. But what, what, yeah, what? that's the million dollar question. The tragedy is we don't have numbers. We don't know how many are transitioning. We don't know how many are detransitioning. I know a few things, so I can tell you a few things. One thing I can start with, which is I started following D-Trans Reddit, and I, I urge everybody who's interested in this subject to go and follow. D-Trans Reddit, is that what you said? Yeah, it's a Reddit, you know, a yeah. subreddit. Red. <laughs> and of the, um, there was less than a thousand members when I start, started following it in 2019. Now there's over 50,000 members. Now they're not all detransitioners and the moderators have done quite a lot of surveys and they say about two thirds of the people are detransitioners. About one third are people like me who are just interested in the subject. And so it's not, that's not scientific, but it's certainly an extraordinary rise in numbers. Then if you look at, there was a study by Lisa Lippman in 2022 which um, studied 100 detransitioners, and of that 100, 76% never informed the clinic that they had detransitioned. They see right. it as kind of returning to the scene of the attack. They feel right. very, very angry and very distressed, and they don't go near the clinics. And another piece of information to work with is that at Genspec, the organization um, I uh, founded and I'm the director, we have a service where we give... Uh, funding for therapy for people who've been harmed by medical transition. We've got about 100 detransitioners on our books and about, no, we've got 200 detransitioners on our books, over 200 and about 100 therapists. And so we are kind of very much working with these um, groups and we find that again and again and again, they feel silenced, they feel vilified. They are the minority within the minority and people don't want hear their story it's, it's a it's a really sad story because they thought mm. they medically transition they might get a mastectomy they might have facial hair a man's voice um maybe you know hair on their on their chest and on their back and their bum and then they realize actually i was a lesbian all along i i shouldn't have medically transitioned and then they try to reverse the pro the, the the process but they don't have breasts they have a masculinized presentation and it's very difficult to return so there's so there's 22 states roughly because uh, there's still some legislation making its way through legislatures across America that ban uh, gender affirming surgery. They're mainly red states as we call them, the Republican states, not all, but mainly. Um, and there, those states have been vilified as you know big, bigoted, hateful places. Now, to be clear, okay, because I'm not a member of either party, there are a lot of bad, bad faith actors in this debate. There are plenty of people who opposed gay civil rights for years that now have a new vote. All of that being said, you know, good faith, bad faith arguments do inform everything from any debate, especially the trans debate, women in sports, all this stuff, because people want to come at it as a fear monger or from a hateful position. But putting that aside, given that we don't have enough evidence and you, you know, your book astutely advises parents to just really think about the children and let it be a parental decision. Do you think that these American states are right in, in codifying into law bans? I'm I very. I want to get into the politics of this now here and abroad. Yeah. I'm I'm very worried about um, how America has gone at um, transition and, and gender in in general. I think they're in quite severe danger of going the way that they went with gun laws and abortion laws. Oops. What is that? Maybe it's one, one I don't think. Is it that my phone? Could be. Sorry. Um, I can't see where it is. I don't know. Maybe. Hang on a second. That's all right. Take your time. <laughs> oh, just, I don't know. I don't know where it's, the ringing is coming from. Somebody, somebody wants you. Yeah, but I wonder. Got to be. Is it a, you have a landline? No, it, it's, it's like it's coming from the computer, but oh, I can't see it. It's almost like it's an alarm. Oh, yeah, it is kind of like that. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. It's, it's, no, it's all right. Is it a phone alarm or maybe something? Hmm? Oh, it's gone. I wonder what that was. No worries. No worries. Okay. We roll. We roll here at the, at the dirty yeah. matter. Yeah, I hope it doesn't come back, though. I wonder where my phone is, because usually I'd have my phone handy and I don't seem to have it handy. Mm -hmm.
Well, I keep going anyway. We're presumably close towards the end. Yes. So to go back to that point, I'll say this again. I hope it doesn't happen again because it just it was come up in my America with gun laws and abortion in what way? Can you be more specific? Yeah. Yeah. I fear um I'm worried about America because I fear that um trans issues are going to go the way of gun laws and abortion issues, which is a red light, red white. <laughs> I'll start again. I fear for America in many ways because I fear that the that America is going the way with trans issues and gender issues, the way they've gone with abortion issues and gun laws, which is it's become a red blue divide. It's yes. become, you know, red state, blue state. It's become your pro or anti. It's very loads of lack of nuance. It's one or the other, black, white, yes, no. And there's no room for, well, hang on, could we perhaps discuss this? Might there be a middle ground? It feels very familiar and it feels very frighteningly divisive and polarized. Yes. And, you know, I don't think the same has happened in Europe. And so they're pulling back on puberty blockers. But it doesn't feel like this is a devastating wing for the right or something like that. It's not been framed like that. It's been no. framed as hospitals have reviewed the evidence. They don't see sufficient evidence to, to stop puberty. And so they've stopped giving puberty blockers. And off we go. But this reframing of it into a red blue issue, no. banning kind of all sorts of every kind of aspect of it. What we want to do in Genspect, and we do have a Genspect USA branch and it's thriving. We want to, for example, have insurance companies meet the responsibilities. So if they ensure medical transition, they need to also ensure the secondary complications related to medical transition. And they also need to ensure detransition. A lot of people who detransition or who have complications, they're not insured to deal with the fact that they have these complications. And so we believe insurance companies need to properly ensure medical transition if they're going to insure it, rather than this like kind of outright bans on everything feels. Uh, yes. last it, well, Some it, of them it, might be great. I don't know. Like you said, 30 uh, odd. Some well, of them could be brilliant. Well, I think you're, no, you're absolutely right from afar. Uh, uh, you know, and again, as I said, I spend a little bit of time living abroad, but you watch America slip into its own worst polarized uh, setup. You know, I've been doing a lot of it now. The pod, my podcast was created to to be for democracy and be able to nuance issues and not be beholden. I'm on the red team. I'm on the blue team. And you're absolutely right. That is where our politics is. And this becomes affiliated with this. I mean, every debate now becomes, well, you can't vote for a Republican because they hate trans people or you, you know, or you can't vote for a Democrat because they believe in open borders. You know, it, everything becomes that, of course, amplified by social media. But again, um, speaking to a very specific thing, I think abortion and guns is a very good example where I'm pro-choice, but, you know, Roe v. Wade had restrictions in the second trimester. Now we're in this, because it was overturned, we're having a debate about everything is a, um, is a drop dead issue that is deeply affecting women. That's, that's real, but you know, that we've lost, certainly lost nuance to any degree in that, uh, in that debate and on the gun debate. And we've done that here, you know, um, I believe in the second amendment. OK, 99 percent of Americans do. And excuse me, 95 percent of gun owners do. And they're not out there killing people in school. They're just not. They're under, it's not true. Um, but the people that do get the get the um, get the uh, press and also laws sometimes get passed. And I did a whole thing with someone who's working with the NRA and gun control people. And I tend to favor gun safety, even though I favor guns, passing laws that won't do anything to stop gun violence. So then it becomes, well, if you're against that law, right, yeah. then you're a horrible monster. You know, it's like, okay, well, that law isn't a good law, you know, similar yeah. to, you know, well, I think if the science isn't settled, I'm just, I'm just philosophizing, you know, postulating the science and settled, well, maybe we shouldn't have gender affirming surgery, you transphobic pig, you know, and yeah. that is what we cut through the thicket here. And by the way, that's what most Americans are so tired of, you know, and, yeah. and yeah. this debate, I think um illuminates our best and worst instincts yeah and that's what i meant i'm not taking a position on abortion no, or gun laws i'm not asking not you know, out. Not yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it's the polarized lack of nuance you're for or against which are you decide now and it's like can we have could we have maybe a conversation 
talking Listen, about I, I'm, I'm in the 75 percent though i'm such an anti-trump person but i'm in the 75 percent of people who don't want this rematch i mean you're at, you're in ireland watching the united states pit joe biden against donald trump I'm sure you grew up, oh, I shouldn't speak for you, a lot of people abroad grew up with a certain reference for the United States as a superpower and what we did. Yeah. I mean, is this particularly exciting to the Irish? <laughs> I, I don't well, know. I, I, I'm looking on just, I, I, I'm astonished that it's going to be Trump versus Biden again. I'm, I'm literally, I can't, because, you know, when, when Trump first got in, effectively the democrats then had four years to kind of regroup and organize themselves to have a good option then biden got in and the republicans had a you know four years to regroup and yet they're not they haven't come up with anybody new it's it's an astonishing and it does feel like maybe money has created a situation where the actual options of who can be president has become really, really small. Something yes. about the system seems broken that oh, it's going to be you. Biden versus Trump. It just seems uh, wrong. From over here, it just seems like that's not working. Oh, no, absolutely. And to close out this wonderful conversation and to relate it to this point, this campaign, okay, when it relates to trans issues, is going to be you're on Biden, you're pro-trans, you're with Trump, you're anti-trans, there won't be anything in between. And that leads me to my sort of final question, is, and, and not, not about Trump-Biden. But with this, the issue of what you're working for, what your book says, what Jen Speck oh, yeah. is doing, please tell everybody what you would like. Okay. That, I want people to read this book. When kids okay. say they're trans, you should follow Stella O'Malley. We're going to get your socials in a second. But Thank you. again, to free ourselves from the shackles of, of childish politics and name calling and, um, and, and idiocy. Just encapsulate, right, how to best nuance a debate. That requires it. So people have well, parents want. listening, non parents, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, we want both from our book, you know, when kids say they're trans, and also from Jen Specht and from myself as a psychotherapist. What we want is an acknowledgement that better outcomes happen as a result of civilized, well thought out, informed yes. discussion. Right. And if we can have discussion of any given treatment, treatment approach, um, condition, um, identity, or yep. any of the above and all, if we can just discuss it, we will come to better outcomes. And so we're advocating, you know, within Gen Spectre, a healthy approach to sex and gender, as in it's healthy to discuss, it's healthy to discuss pros and cons, you know, the, the good and the bad, make sure that we include all the different kind of uh, people's stories. And then in our book, when kids say they're trans, it's like, yeah, let parents be the parent of their child fundamentally most parents really really care about their children give parents back their authority to be an authority on their children's lives there's been a kind of a creeping kind of um lack of respect for parents and also presumption that the parents are hurting their children and i'm like well the experts and i include myself as a psychotherapist we haven't covered ourselves in glory in history <laughs> we're not that great and as i said earlier if if ritalin and adderall and all that was going to cure and help the younger generation we would know it uh, the results are not good we're in a generation of young people now who seem to be really crippled by mental health issues and i i don't know why that is but i do think it it's it merits a lot of free and informed and civilized discussion no i, I, I amen and um again the book is When Kids Say They're Trans. Stella O'Malley co-wrote it with Sasha Ayad and Lisa Marciano. She is a psychotherapist who works on these issues and many more around an organization called GenSpect, as I mentioned in the introduction. Where can people find you? Are you on uh, X, Twitter? Are you anywhere to be found? I'm sure you are. I'm on X. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. It's Stella O'Malley. GenSpect is also on all that. And also we have a podcast called Gender Wider Lens if people want to hear more. We've hundreds right. of episodes. Did myself and Sam. What's your Twitter handle? Sorry, your X Oh, Stella here. O'Malley. Uh, Stella O'Malley 3, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Stella, well, I, I you know, Stella, I really appreciate this conversation. You know, it's exactly uh, what we do, finding that middle lane and having nuance for a very important subject. And again, the, needless to say, the kids are not all right. They need all the help they can get. And we need experts to be willing to be humble and open and, and you know, 
not propagandize, just tell people what it is and let parents make these decisions. I think they're for, about, for a limited government guy, I like that the most. Not the government, not the institutions, not all the experts who are not covered in glory, as you say. <laughs> who love their children. Stella, thank you for joining uh, the show. Uh, as for the rest of us, what do I always tell you? Stay dirty, stay moderate, and stay safe. Thank you very much.